Let me tell you a little bit about Clarence. He's the president and CEO of the Capital Credit Group. It's a business funding and finance company, and we all need funding at different times. He's raised in White Plains, New York. He attended Syracuse University and served in the United States Army Dental Corps as a dental therapist. He was smart. He didn't want to be in the field. He's no dummy. I like this. <laughs> He's a veteran who received the Overseas Medal, the Good Conduct Medal, the Expert Marksman Badge, and the Army Achievement Medal. He's very well decorated. And, and thank you for your service, Clarence. All right, thank you. His business career expands over 25 years. He provides business owners with business funding products, cash advances, business loans, does factoring, assistance with securing government contracts, does real estate financing, equipment leasing, and many, many more. I had a great time talking to him over lunch. He also gives back, which I really, really love to hear. He had his sixth annual uh, charity golf tournament, proceeds that are, are donated to various charities, individuals with dis disabilities and to homeless veterans, as well as people with prostate cancer survivors. So good job there, Clarence. Thanks again, Doug. He also, his pastimes, he likes helping people that are disadvantaged, likes traveling, and he likes golf. He was actually featured on the cover of Pro Golf Magazine back in 2005. Now that's a great story. Hopefully we'll hear about that later on. <laughs> But we, before we get into the conversation with Clarence, and, and I met him when I was asked to testify in front of Congress on the Small Business Administration. In fact, there was 35 of us from across the country. And not every state was representative, was represented, but uh, I mean, really was a really interesting thing. First time I uh, ever uh, talked to Congress. Uh, Clarence has done it many times. But, you know, it was so crazy because the meeting started at 1.30. And I wanted to leave way enough time so I wouldn't be rushed. You know how parking and driving in DC is just a friggin' nightmare. So I left plenty of time, got to the Rayburn building, and of course started looking for a parking spot because I had about an hour. I'm looking and looking, I don't think I told you this story. I'm looking and looking, I finally find a spot and I was so proud of myself because you know, I don't know how I got into that spot. I mean it was, it took me about 20 minutes to get into the spot. So you know, I go, find a spot, getting ready to put my money in a meter and I see, look at the sign, Two-hour parking. <laughs> the meeting was four hours. I said, oh, no. So I'm driving back. I was actually going in the wrong direction. Drive back, flag down a cop. Where's the, I'm begging now, where's the parking garage? Because I couldn't find one. Finally find one. Look at my watch. And I got 10 minutes to get there before 1.30. And I'm about 15 minutes away. And I'm doing exactly what I didn't want to do. I'm racing to the Rayburn building. And I see a side door that, that I can possibly go in. I started walking, I had my briefcase, and then I, then I hear, halt or I'll shoot. <laughs> I mean, I'm ready to go home, man. I'm ready to, you know, because I guess it's Congress, and you're saying, you know, I said, I'm here to testify, put my arms up like this. I said, I'm here to testify in front of Congress. The front of the building is around the corner, you know, so I race around the corner, race in, it's now 1.35, I figure I'm five minutes late, walk in, there's a seat next to Clarence. I sit down. I'm saying, did it start yet? No, we started at 2 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. But I did have the chance to sit next to Clarence. And, uh, I mean, I tell you, it was a really, really exciting thing. Congress, believe it or not, they do do some things. They are interested in small business. Mm -hmm. And the most important thing that we heard, because I, I, I polled people from our group and down, you know, up and down the East Coast or various groups, and... Business financing was the number one. There was three other ones, healthcare and so forth. But uh, Clarence was short of the star of the show in terms of, uh, of talking about that because that was the number one thing. How can we get more money for small business when they need it? Clarence, tell us everybody a little bit how you, how you got your invitation. To, I'm sure you didn't have a problem with a parking spot like I did. <laughs> um, I took Metro. I kind of know the D.C. area. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> I'll know next time. I said <laughs> well, it was my first time. <laughs> they called me. <laughs> well, uh, I actually um, know my congressman, uh, Jerry Connolly, very, very well. And he introduced me to Congressman Lawson from Florida, who's, uh, who's co-chair of, um, of the small business, um, uh, congressional, congressional small business committee. And uh, so I received the invite, and along with a, another friend of mine from Florida. Uh, she was invited as well, Deborah Thompson. And so the questions 
started coming around and we answered a majority of the questions. Uh, it was so funny because uh, we started, you know, and it was a, a big U-shaped table and Clarence and I were literally right in the middle. I mean, mm -hmm. I opened yes. the door and there was a spot, so I just jumped on and, and it's, unfortunately it was next to Clarence. But about, there was probably about 10 or 12 people ahead of us where we went around the room and we, sort of like CEO club with the guests, and we introduced ourselves. First guy gets up and starts telling his life story when he was 12 years old. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm not kidding. And these people were going on and on and on. Clarence was right before me. He gave a little bit of his life story. <laughs> I jumped on the table, told a little bit more, and then as soon as we got done, they said, wait a minute. You got 30 seconds each, <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> it was like we got, we got dinged. But fortunately, we, we got to tell our story. Tell everybody a little bit about, you know, when you talk about alternative financing. You know, what needs does it fill for business, and, and people that are interested, what do they need to do? Um, well, well, the need is, is definitely there. Uh, the majority of our clients are all referrals from banks. And the reason that banks have a guideline that they need to stick to. So if their requirement is 680 credit score and you have 679, guess what? You get dinged. So um, in working with the banks, we found that it's a good relationship because we're not a bank, but yet we can get them funding through various sources, uh, private, through private sources, and we don't have to follow those FDIC checklists. So we basically look at a business overall <coughs> picture uh, the, the growth of the business, the, is, is it on an, um, an incline or, or is it decreasing? What are the reasons and what are the factors that are affecting that business owner? So that's what we look at and we look at if we loan them money, can they pay it back? It's pretty simple. And um, if you have X, a company has X number of liquid uh, cash at the end of the month, they should be able to get a loan because they have something to pay it back. Do they have a proven track record? Maybe yes, maybe no, maybe it has a few dings on it. However, we look at what they have and then we judge on whether or not they can pay us back. And that's, re that's really the bottom line. So a relationship with a bank is very good. The client now doesn't leave the bank, the client stays with that bank. Partic usually if a client is returned down, they'll take their assets from the bank. They may take their mortgage, They'll take their checking accounts, they'll tell the cousins, they'll tell the wives, and they leave the bank and they'll go over to another bank. But the other bank has the same guidelines. But as a small business owner, they, most people do not realize that. And so that bank promises them something, and 30 days later, they're still in the same place. So why not, as a bank, as an as a institution, pass that client off to a secondary who can get the client funded? Where's that money gonna go? right back in their bank, we're not a bank. So that's our relationship and that's the, how we uh, receive majority of our clients on the business lending side. So you really, you're helping to retain the business for the bank. It's almost a, you're like a retentive officer, if you will. You're an adjunct. Exactly, I wish they would pay us though. <laughs> <laughs> so is it, is it strictly on a cash flow analysis that you make the decisions? Uh, it's cash flow and it's also the business, the entity of the business. What type of business? Is it, a, is it a restaurant that's been in business for nine years and is just going through some changes? Is it a, is it a, a physician who's just starting his or her practice? So there's various uh, models and various, um, various critiques that we kind of follow through. And this is all put into a software system. <laughs> I, I'm not that smart, okay? <laughs> So we feed this into uh, FinTech, which is a financial software that delivers a, um, a risk factor for us, and then we make that decision on whether or not to take that risk. So what percentage of the people that apply f with you, I mean, banks, as like you said, they have strict guidelines. They don't, you know, it's 679, put me 680, <laughs> they're, they're gone. You know, your guidelines are cash flow. When people come to you, what percentage of the people are successful? And how long, most importantly, how long does it take? Because we know going through committees with banks can take months and months and months. Generally, uh, we can turn around and answer in 72 hours. Realistically, I can do it in 48. But if I say 72 and I'm there at 48, wow. then I over deliver. But that's, uh, that's based upon technology. What has actually happened, and I just want to touch on this r really quick, the traditional lending of banks are considered, and this is just a recent article that was just written uh, last week. The tra traditional lending 
model for banks are like Blockbuster and Kodak. Where is Blockbuster right now? No more. Because Blockbuster had the opportunity to buy Netflix, <coughs> didn't, did not jump on that opportunity. Wow. Now what do we do? We see Netflix, Blockbuster is history. Where's Kodak? They missed a chance for the digital age. Where are they? They're not Kodak anymore. Okay? <laughs> so banks have need to get into the technology and utilize, utilization of FinTech um, technology, which is software. Normally you go to the bank and just present it to a nice customer service rep. They pass it off to the branch manager. Branch manager sends it to underwriting. Underwriting tells you yay or nay. That's 30 days. We do this in 48, 72 hours. So that's the future because businesses and individuals now are looking to have things done now. They want, they want that loan now. They don't, you, you may have a, a project that, uh, a development project, but if you don't, you don't buy that piece of land right now, it's gone. And that's how competitive it, it is out there. So you need to have a, com a competitive financial um, alternative, and that's what we provide. Is that what some of the competitors do? I know we see people, the, some of the Shark Tank, Tank people are advertising for some of these immediate type of financing people, Swift Capital. Uh, that we, probably people in the room here get, get letters probably once or twice a week. Yeah. You know, we can lend you half a million dollars. Is that what you're talking about in terms of the competitors? Um, actually, they are pretty much considered not really competitors. Um, those are really, that's on the verge of predatory lending. And right now, the, one of the, the um, legislation that we were asked to give an opinion on and help draft is to stop the predatory lending. Because these people are sending you information. Just because you're, you have a business, they don't know whether or not you qualify. How could they? they? They know nothing about you. They don't know your financials. But if you just happen to be a business that needs cash at that time, and you accept that call, well, you're going to pay about 40% for your money. And you're going to have to pay it back daily, five days a week, daily, ACH out of your account. They don't trust you to send them a check. Those days are long gone. Do, do they send Bruno out, too, to meet with you? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, they, they, well, and the point that the, the attorney made, those contracts that you're signing are locked. They are ironclad. You're not going to be able to get out of it. So they'll come after your house because you did a personal guarantor. They'll come after your house, they'll come after your car. Any asset you own, you're liable for. So it is definitely have someone, if that happens to you, you be really run because they don't know who you are. Go to a reputable, uh, uh, call us. Why don't, just call us. <laughs> yes, but the, the, that's, uh, that's predatory lending. Yeah, we don't want to go there. Tell everybody how you got started in this uh, alternative lending. You know, you have a background in hospitality and, and dentistry, and how'd you, how'd you make that transition? Well, as a kid, uh, growing up, um, I was always told to have at least two jobs, you know. <laughs> and that was pretty much the case. I, when I was younger, I had two paper routes. Other kids had one. I had two. And Wait, did you have daily and Sunday though? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sunday was a monster. Yeah, that's five thirty. That's at like four thirty in the morning. Yeah, in the morning. yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, from there, I've just always been more than one type of guy. So when I was like fifteen, I was able to get a a, a position as a dishwasher, but I was not the dishwasher. I was the pots and pans guy. <laughs> <laughs> So then the dishwasher moved up to busboy. So I moved into dishwasher. Yeah, yeah, no more pots and pans. Uh, and then from there, I moved to busboy. So all th throughout high school, I always had you know, a job, a part-time job, and it was in the restaurant business. And then when I went to college, I was good, greater, as good enough. To, I was a waiter in a French restaurant. Uh, Hotel Syracuse, Renaissance Room. So you're bringing back memories. Parlez-vous français. So, <laughs> oui, oui. <laughs> <laughs> I know the food, you know, Chateaubriand, you know. <laughs> Filet de sol, you know. <laughs> um, other than that, and I'm out of it. <laughs> um, so so um, I, I became a bartender, and at that time, I'm going to make this quick. At that time, there was unions. So I had a union card. So that meant I could go to another place and just say, hey, here's my union card. And they would hire you. Um, 
And so I, I've just always been in the restaurant business when I was in the military in the dental corps. Uh, my part-time job was a bartender at the officers club. Um, and so I just kind of stuck in the hospitality industry. But while I was in the military, I was in the dental corps, which was really a tough job. I worked from seven to four every day and I wore wonderful whites. Um, and I was unlucky to go to the field. Once a year, we'd go to the field. And what does the dentist do in the field? Drink beer and eat steaks. <laughs> <laughs> tough job, I don't have a game on that. Uh, and I, had, I was involved in a, in a training accident, so I was um, I left the military as a service disabled veteran. Um, and uh, I opened up a company that was doing marketing for dental practices because that's what I knew. And it led to medical practice because the dentist I started with had a brother who was a plastic surgeon who had a wife that was a dentist that had a cousin. And it just kept on going and going. Um, and finding money and opening up dental clinics um, I found investors, and one day, after seven years, the guy said to me, he says, Clarence, you're pretty good at finding this money. Why are you still managing dental practices? There's more money in commissions on finding money. And so that's how we got started. That's okay. pretty much. And in 2004, everybody was out of money, so they started knocking on doors, and 210, a real estate division came on. My friend Clive, uh, and now is the man that uh, runs that division. So that's where got me to this place that got me to Congress to testify, and this is where I met Doug, and now I'm in Baltimore in front of this wonderful group of people here at the CEO, CEO Club. We love having you. Clyde makes me think about the Motown guy. Clyde, what was there? The, the, the Clive and Motown? Is that what that? Oh, Clyde Davis? Clive Davis, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thinking about Clyde. <laughs> Want to start singing for the uh, <laughs> <laughs> No singing. Yeah. Put you on America Got Talent. Well, tell us along with that. So tell us about the services you provide. You know, how, what do you do to evaluate your clients? How do you do the go or the no-go? Say okay. somebody want to get involved with you. Um, we, services we provide, are, um, we stay away from the uh, merchant cash advance as much as possible. However, there are some times that a person is very in, a, in, a, in dire straits um, and we have to go, go that route only if they choose to go that way. Other than that, then we do basically lending and we're only a few points off of what uh, a bank would charge. So we're uh, between that eight to 15% ratio. Um, that's our business loan side. We have also have a startup program for startup businesses where we can get the business owner up to 150,000 based upon their credit. And these are unsecured loans. Um, what it does is allow you to get a major credit card from a bank um, and utilize the, those funds for the purchases of your business, which in turn, they report to trade lines. So now your business has credit and it's not your personal. So you always wanna separate those two. You wanna have business credit here and personal here. So once you've established business lines and ports to Dun and Bradstreet and you have a pay deck score, then you can go and pretty much get traditional funding. Uh, we tr actually try, we guide individuals back to traditional funding. Um, if you were apply with us, any client that applies with us, if there's a reason that we do turn them down, then we tell them that reason and we look to try to fix that reason, whether it's updating certain records, um, making sure that cash flow is, is the same. You, you have hair salons and nail salons, they deal a lot in cash. So they put it in the pocket, so it was, and restaurants, which is really not the way to do it because you're actually making more money in your business. So if you needed to borrow some money, it shows you have a strong cash flow instead of putting it in your pocket. And you pay taxes, that's all you have to do. I mean, if you're paying taxes, it's good. You'll pay as, it's as little as possible. That's why you have the CPA over here to guide you through those things. And you have a wealth building strategist here to help guide you those, through those things. So that, that's very important, business credit and personal credit. So that program will allow a business to establish their own credit. Uh, we do factoring. Factoring is one of the simple, uh, simplest and least expensive way to, get, to influx cash into your business. Generally as a contractor, um, the, as a sub to a general contractor, they have to wait until the general contractor pay, pays them. Or the federal government. They take 45. Long time. Or either longer. 
So in that meantime, how do you pay your employees? Well, factoring is basically no more than 4%. Really? So it's one of the simplest and least expensive ways to get money. So with a factoring, is you say, Doug, you come to me and you say, listen, um, this general contractor is not going to pay me for 30 days, but I have to pay my employees. So, Doug, you give me your invoice. I'll front you 80% of that invoice. And then I'll, sit, I'll make sure that you completed the work with the gentleman there. He'll say yes. I give you 80%, send your bank account within 24 days. Whenever he pays, he pays directly to me. I'll take my 2 to 4% off, and then I'll give you a rebate. Wow. And so you can continually do that over and over. So if, if you've heard bad news about factoring, it's because someone really didn't do it correctly. Or they were dealing with someone who wasn't evaluated correctly. So we do not evaluate the individual. We evaluate the, the general contractor. Or if it's the federal government, we know the federal gov government's going to pay. Question is when. So we're willing to wait for, those, uh, for, for that payment to come to us. Um, we, do know, we do have an affiliation with a company that will help you uh, invest your 401 or your IRA into starting your own business or influx cash into your business. That is something we don't do, but we have a, we're affiliated with companies that specialize in that. You talked about the differential between the personal side of your assets and the business side of your assets. When somebody applies for a loan, can it just be signing business-wise, or do you ask for a personal guarantee as well? On our end, it's yes. We ask for a personal guarantee. Well, we have I, something there, Clarence. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I nobody, really nobody has. Everybody has to sign personally. Yes. And in most cases, even with the bank, you're going to sign a personal guarantee. Yeah. I really don't know uh, any program out there that's not going to require a personal guarantee. Tell us a little bit how you differentiate yourself from your competitors. I mean, there's some people that do what you do. I mean, you, you do it very, very well. I was very impressed when I met you. and Congress was very impressed. I could see that. What differentiates you? Um, we actually are hands-on. I'm hands-on. My representatives, they're hands-on. If it needs to be, if they're, and the reason we have reps in different areas is because we want to have that feeling. So if you're from Baltimore to Richmond, I'm going to be in your face. I'm going to have the conversation with you. I'm going to meet you at least once. I'm going to understand what you have. And I'm simply off a solution. I solve problems. I don't, I don't create those. You tell me what you want. I'll tell you what programs we have that may fit what your need, your need is. If it doesn't fit now, we can revisit this at, a, at another time. If for some reason we, don't, we aren't able to help you, I'll tell you why we aren't, and we'll try to fix that. Give us an idea, what's a profile? What does your best client look like? You know, with obviously somebody that pays their bill, <laughs> but you know, what's the profile? Um, that's <laughs> Wanda? Wanda's my profile. <laughs> no, great credit, assets, and just need, do not want to use your personal money, OPM, other people's money, and, and I recommend that. Okay, use other people's money. Your cash is king. Cash is always going to be king. Keep your cash, OPM, and get done what you want. And the other thing that you and I was talking about, right, <laughs> kind of like a pet peeve of mine, okay? Some people say I'm wrong. I don't think so. You told me you were never wrong, <laughs> Clark. <laughs> I always say, I don't care what the interest rate is. And the reason I say that is because I'm looking for my ROI. Okay, that's what you look for. I'll pay 50% interest rate if I know I'm gonna make 150. Without it, I make zero. So don't be afraid to, you, you, that risk factor, you, have, you gotta take that risk factor sometimes. You know, if, you, if I borrow $100,000, you say, pay me back 50. I'll say good because I know that hundreds gonna make me too, and I'm ahead of the game. So that's how you want. That's a business cap, not a consumer hat. There's two hats. Consumers think about how much is that interest rate? How much am I gonna pay for that suit? Is it gonna go on sale? How much am I gonna pay for that purse? Is it worth it? Okay. You, that's something that you can worry about. Okay. You can wait a month and come back and it's on sale. Okay. In business, you have an opportunity. The opportunity is now. You have to act on that opportunity now. So if it costs you a little bit more and you know you're going to make it, you get more that way because you're going somewhere. Now you're at the next level. That's $150,000 you didn't have before. Now you're playing a different ball game. 
So will you pay 50% interest again on 150 if you're not going to make 300 all day long and twice on Sundays? Interesting concept. Okay, we're going to open it up. Who's got some questions for Clarence? In terms, of Steve. Right. What does your customer look like in terms of, in terms of frequency? Who is your most frequent customer, and what is he trying to do with his money? Our most frequent customer, um, small, medium-sized business, anywhere from a restaurant um, to um, a construction company. Um, generally, everyone is looking to grow. Uh, I, all, I advise clients, if you're borrowing money to pay bills, really not the best situation to do because you're not, it's not gonna generate, uh, unless it's for some reason that you have this wonderful deal that's gonna happen if you can clear up this remaining debt. But you try not to borrow money to cover debt. You borrow money to excel your company. Yes, ma'am, Suzanne. So I don't understand the industry you know, intimately like you do, but I have a client who has a lot of government contracts. And in the past, and he's doing really, really well. But in the past, when he's gone to get capital, most banks don't look at those contracts as assets or whatnot. So they, you know, they frown. They don't lend against that. Do you do you look at those contracts and count that? Uh, yes, and, and thanks a lot for, for asking that question. There, there's also if you have a contract, if it's federal government, state of Maryland, city of Baltimore, if it's a high level value client, you actually have money. So it can be, if it's a purchase order, in certain cases, we will purchase that purchase order from you. So if you, if, if you were had a makeup deal and, and, or you had clothing, and Macy said, I need $200,000 of these jackets, okay? And you said, wow, this is gonna be a big deal in my life. Where do I get the money to manufacture those jackets? Well, you come to us, that's a purchase order. Because we know eventually, once you deliver those jackets to Macy's, they're gonna, cut your check. Well, they'll cut us the check because we'll help you manufacture that and get your product uh, to deliver. On government contracts, uh, the factoring is generally uh, one of the best ways to go. Like I say, generally, the, your highest price you're going to pay in 60, for 60 days cash is about 4%. That's fantastic. If I heard factoring that anywhere is 10 to 20% in uh, the past. Well, that's a guy with a gun. <laughs> that's Bruno. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir, Steve. Well, we like to say 25 and, and above. We, we, we could do 100 million if necessary. We could do 500 million if we bring in the right people. It depends on the product and uh, what the project is. Uh, it, it takes us the same amount of time to do 25,000 as it does to do 100. <laughs> it would take us the same amount of time to do a $5,000 deal, but there's no cushion in there, really. <laughs> it's, it's not really worth it. Is the, is the process longer with a larger deal like that? If somebody wanted, you know, say a couple million? Um, no, uh, basically, I, I never need, if it's a million dollar deal, I just need the last two years of your taxes, financials, profit and loss statement, um, and six months to a year's bank statements. All just electronically, we review those and it can get done. And within a couple of days? I can get you an answer. I can get an offer in 72 hours. I wow. stick to that. If it happens it? in 48, we're all happy. So for commercial real estate, how long of a note would you give? If it, let's say it's at two million. Um, that is a question. I would say, yeah. please. Defer to Clyde. <laughs> 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 what was the question for commercial real estate? How long will you give a note? How long will you give a note? Yeah. How long will you give a note? So, you're, what, uh, what exactly, what exactly are you trying to do with the real estate? Are you trying I'm buying to, a commercial. You're building. buying. You're just buying the commercial and, building. And, yes, and I'm buying the commercial building for an investment, right. and partially owner occupied. Right. So we have programs that will do amortize over 30 years. Oh, really? at, you know, five to ten years. So. Now he mentioned you're a couple of points over a bank. Typically, good credit. Well, that, again, again, it's so it depends. We evaluate everyone individually. Yeah. You right. know, so. Right, so so it's, it's it's a little bit more than that. It's
it's it's probably around six to okay. six to fourteen or so. So it just again, it depends. It depends. I have another question. Yes, ma'am. What are the downfalls? I, I understand SBA has changed drastically over the last few years. When I eleven years ago, I thought SBA was a big joke because the interest rates were much higher. I could stand on my own, but the bank still wanted to put it through the SBA. So how is SBA different for today, and is it a good thing or a bad thing? Before you answer the question about SBA, for the, for the tape, the last question was about uh, commercial financing. What's the length of time that it would take? Uh, would you be interested in doing, and what's the approximate rate? And it was a little bit more than the traditional rate, but uh, that was for the tape. You can answer Juan's, Juan's question about SBA. Um, SBA has made some improvements um, in, in certain areas, um, but it's pretty much still pretty much generally the same. You're going to be looking at, at at least 20% of whatever the amount you need. Um, you're going to be looking at anywhere from a month to six months before you get an answer. I do have a SBA program that I can get you an answer within six weeks. Okay. Uh, uh, they're 68%. 68? Yes, ma'am. So they're the same as you? Yes. In some yes. instances? Yes. In some instances, yes, ma'am. Steve. Uh, assume for a second I'm a young man, I'm 25 years old, I, I have a high school diploma, and I was the captain of the football team, and I want to open a barbershop. So I Good. come to you, I have no credit history. Zero. I've never purchased a thing in my life. So I don't really have much. Uh, I don't have any assets. Can you help me? I want to open a barbershop. Um, I'll, t I'll tell you what you should do, okay? And that would be to first go open a bank account and establish about three to four months of some type of income going into the bank. Um, with the, and then we'll also pull your credit at that time and find out exactly what your credit says. It, it may be that you will tell you to take $200 and get an unsecured uh, business card from Capital One or Wells Fargo or whoever, and that means you put $200 in it and you pay, pay each each, uh, each month the bill, that way you'll establish some credit, okay? But uh, yeah, there's pretty much credit, the length of credit, wonderful question, the length of your credit history does play a part. That's a part that we look at, and the bank may, been, may, may not play that as a larger role as we do. That weighs heavily with us because it's a proven track record. So the older you are, the more money you're probably gonna get. Paul, and the <laughs> Uh, Clarence, I'm just curious, so where does uh, your uh, money come from that you lend? And it's just a curiosity question. Uh, is it institutional or commercial, other commercial banks or the, investors or, or your, or your uh, vault in your bank? Okay. He's got a big vault. I it's over at Dave, it's at Dave's house. At <laughs> <laughs> Doug's house. I'm sorry. It's at Doug's house. Um, we deal with uh, private investors, uh, different groups that we've had established relationships with throughout the years. Um, there are very few banks that we work with. If they are, then they're usually uh, community type banks that are, are willing to go uh, take that risk with you because it will be generally within that area of where you live, so they have a good scope of what the, what the environment is there. Um, there are, are hard money lenders. There's a list of those that you know, we, we tap into as well. Um, we personally, um, we're more involved in real estate from the personal company side. That's more of our investment strategy. Yeah, very good, thank you. You're welcome. Basilio, then Eric. So back to the government contract example, right? When you basically lend against those contracts, let's say it's a $2 million contract, you lend against it, and at half a million bucks, they terminate for convenience. How does that play into your model? Um, if, the term, if, they, if they default on the contract? No, if the government just goes, the state of Maryland does what they love to do, terminate <laughs> for convenience. Okay. They feel like it. There's only half a million dollars of work left. Okay. $2 because what we do is we only pay on the invoice that's submitted. So you work for two weeks, you turn it in on Friday, we'll have money on that because it has to be okay that it was completed work. So on the completed work, the, the state is obligated or that entity is obligated to pay us. So you'll do a half a million or you take a percentage of the half a million? We'll front you 80% of the invoice 
and then what is left, so that 20% left over, we take our fee from that and then we'll re rebate you the remainder. So yeah, we will never front out long term on the contract, just only work completed. That's the key. Once you complete the work, we'll pay you. Eric. I was just curious, what, what's your default rate compared to traditional lending? Um, very low. I think we're, we're about uh, default rate, 4 to 6% somewhere in that neighborhood. Uh, I would say traditional is probably a little bit higher. Yeah, they, they, because they, they tend to write off a lot of debt. Um, banks are known to liquidate uh, real estate or anything else that they have so that it's not on their books. Um, but yeah. Tom. If somebody stops paying you, how much do you work with them? Uh, when do you pull the trigger and go after their assets? 30 days or less. Well, you, you're, you're doing ACH though, aren't you? Yes. But after, after a couple of, after three rejections, the deal's done. So if you're, if you're paying a weekly or a monthly ACH or, or bi-weekly, if, if we go there three times, doesn't matter what, if it's Friday and you're supposed to be on the 15th, if we go there three times, whether it's Friday, Monday, Tuesday, after three times, the deal's done. And then, yes, it's pretty immediate. So, if you have like a large commercial project and say it's a $100,000 project and you just want to get involved with it, but you know you need enough money because it's a like UGC GC and they're not going to fund you anything, is that something you would work with? Or? If you have that project, again, I think going back to it, if you start that project for all the work you complete, We'll pay 80% of that. So just on completed work is what you pay Only on completed work. Key word, on any factoring, it's completed work. It has to be completed because what we will do is we'll notify that general contractor and say, Paul, did he pay his, is he, did, was the work okay? Is there any change orders, et cetera? He says, work's complete. We believe him, we're gonna pay you because he is the person that we're vetting because of his reputation. We know that he's gonna pay, it's just a matter of when he's gonna pay us. It's kind of like an AR loan, essentially. Well, yes, you could say accounts receivable loan, yeah. yes. That's really what factoring is. Yes, I mean, accounts uh, receivable, yes. Yeah. Who else, any other questions? Okay, Clarence, great job. Appreciate you having us. Appreciate <laughs> you.